have my own arm in here. And thank you guys for welcoming her so much. Okay, now we're going to have our third song, God's Love is Deep Within Me. After that, we'll have the daily word and then our meditation. circumstances, I choose to affirm freedom. I experience freedom with my mind, body, and soul. My unlimited spirit can never be bound by outer conditions. One cannot bind peace, joy, and love. I express my spiritual gifts with every thought of forgiveness, every moment spent with a friend, every word of kindness. As I share my thoughts and my gifts, I experience liberation. I am free right where I am. And from Galatians 5.13, for you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Now we're going to have our meditation song. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. We're done. We're, we're done. done. We're done. <laughs> we'll have our meditation song and then Reverend Margaret will do our meditation. Oh 
shining light. And as you breathe, just put a slight sound that your consciousness hear the beautiful, beautiful breath of spirit. Moving in and moving out, sounding like the ocean waves. Everything is in divine order. And just as the ocean moves in and moves out, Holy Spirit breathes us. We give ourselves over to the holy breath that renews and restores and regenerates every cell, every atom of our being. When we take our breaths consciously, we give ourselves over to healing, renewal, transformation. That alone, deep conscious breath, is enough to move us out of fear and into peace. I read to you this morning from Hafiz, and the title of the poem is, You Were Brave in That Holy War. You have done well in the Holy War. You are brave. You have all the honorable wounds of one who has Try to find love where it seems the beautiful bird could not be found. May I speak to you like we are close and locked away together. <coughs> Once I found a stray kitten and I soaked my fingers in warm milk. And the kitten came to think I was five mothers on one hand. Wayfarer, why not rest your tired body? Lean back and close your eyes. Come morning, I will kneel by your side and feed you. I will so gently feed you and let you taste something of my sacred mind and life. Surely there is something wrong with your ideas of God. Surely there is something wrong if you think our beloved would not be as tender to you. As we continue to take our deep breaths, I invite us all to feel the tenderness of spirit. Even in the hardest of circumstances. The tender, precious spirit that waits for us to feel the presence of love even when our hearts are most hurting. As we take a moment of silence, we let ourselves feel the tenderness, the comforting presence of Holy Spirit. And we know now that all those we hold in our hearts can also feel the presence of Holy Spirit. And certainly, even when they cannot, they are embraced by this tender, comforting presence. And we hold them in prayer. Our children, our grandchildren, our beloved friends and family and community, our world leaders, religious leaders, all those gathering today in synagogues and mosques and temples and cathedrals, tiny villages and huge cities, to draw closer to this comforting presence. And now is the time we speak names out loud if you wish to do so of those that you're holding in prayer. Susan Bowles. All those who've written in for prayer. We give thanks for the healing, rejuvenating, restorative presence of spirit within us, around us. We give 
ourselves over to it. And we say, so it is, and so we let it be. Namaste. <coughs> Like that of one of them. 
Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Uh, let me speak to you today from a sermon that I call Beyond Tired. Beyond Tired. Dear Lord, use me. Use me today so that another in this sanctuary may be blessed by you as you have so greatly blessed me. I am here to serve you, Lord, so I ask that you use me. In Jesus' name, amen. Life certainly has its ups and downs. Not just our lives, the lives of a nation, the life of a people, the life of an individual. Life is always a series of ups and downs. Sometimes life feels good, sometimes life feels troubled. If you ever need evidence of life's ups and downs, the book of 1 Kings demonstrates this over and over again. Let me give you a quick summary of the ups and downs of this period in the life of Israel. As it begins, Solomon inherits the throne from David, and Israel is a great unified nation. Solomon is so blessed that God literally offers to give him anything he wants, and he asks for and gets wisdom. I said, that's an up. <laughs> but over time, Solomon doesn't act so wisely. In fact, he gets downright sleazy. That's marrying 700 women, taking on a couple of hundred more concubines, and then he's worshiping an idol. By the time his son Rehoboam becomes king, Israel is such a mess, it literally breaks into two nations. I'd say that's a damn. Mm -hmm. And for another 50 years or so, both nations go through a series of bad things, ignoring the commandments of the Lord. Eventually, Ahab inherits the throne of Israel and marries Jezebel. Yep, the original Jezebel. <laughs> She's a serious idolatrist who convinces her husband to lead the entire nation to, entire nation to worship Baal. Now, if you ask me, that's getting pretty close to rock bottom. But as Israel moves along in blissful ignorance, the prophet Elijah arrives. He's a prophet who will not be ignored. He lets Ahab and Jezebel know that the Lord is so angry about their worship of the false idols and prophets of Baal that he will punish the land with a drought. And the drought lasts for years. Ahab and Jezebel blame Elijah. So he becomes a fugitive. That's a damn. But while he's on the run, he has the Lord's favor. And he's fed by raven. He finds streams of water and is sent by the Lord to a widow who cares for him. When her son dies, Elijah is able to bring that son back to life. I say that's a big up. Three years later, Elijah returns to Israel. Again, Ahab blames him for the drought, but Elijah makes clear that it's Ahab's fault that there is so much trouble. To prove the power of the Lord, Elijah stages a great battle with 850 false prophets on Mount Carmel. Of course, through the power of the Lord, Elijah defeats all 850 false prophets. He then has them killed with Ahab standing there watching. And then Elijah prays to the Lord for rain, which the Lord delivers. I say that's a very, very, very big up. Now when you've had a victory that great, when you have just proven to an entire people that the Lord is indeed God, that he is on your side, when you have defeated the Lord's enemy in such a crushing public fashion, you think that you get to favor that, savor that victory, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? But unfortunately, 
Life's ups and downs don't always work out that way. Elijah is one of my favorite people in the Bible. I know that kid's name is Elijah. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> There's no accent. So when he finally gets this victorious moment, I want Elijah to be able to stay with it. But he doesn't. Because Jezebel threatens him, and Elijah runs for his life. Elijah is human. He arrived in Israel to show the people both the errors of their ways. And he succeeded in his mission. The people have returned to believing in the Lord as their only God. And yet here in chapter 9, we find him tired. Tired from all the running. Tired from all the effort. Tired of Ahab and certainly tired of Jezebel. He's not just tired. He's beyond tired. In today's world, we call that depressed. I don't mean he was a bit sad. I don't even mean he was grieving. No, he was depressed. You know how I know he was depressed? Look at the text. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He was so tired, he couldn't do anything but lie down for days. He'd lost all hope. He couldn't imagine a future. He asked God, not for life, but for death. He no longer thought he deserved to live. He was beyond tired. He was depressed. And I know exactly how he felt. I suffer with depression. I don't mean I get sad every once in a while. I mean without treatments, I suffer weeks at a time, unable to function normally. Instead of a broom bush, I have my bedroom. I stay in my bed for days that run into weeks. With the light flow, unable to have a conversation, not able to even eat too much, completely without hope. It's not like this all the time. I have long periods of ups, then a bit of a down, then up again. For example, a few years ago, life was pretty, was just simply lovely. My son graduated from high school and was off to London for six months, visiting his father's family there, a trip that I didn't have to pay for. <laughs> I was working three days a week while still getting paid full time because I was required to use up some of my safe vacation days. And on top of all that, I had lost 32 pounds in less than a year. Okay, let me say that again. <laughs> I lost 32 pounds in a year. I had to slay 850 balls prop, but my life was sweet. I miled up. Gradually, life started getting back to normal. I was back to work five days a week. My son came home. I was happy to see him, but my food bills had been much smaller while he was gone, and having his room as a TV room had gotten kind of comfortable. None of these things in and of themselves were a big deal. I was just back to my regular comfortable routine. Not up, not down. Just comfortable. One day, I didn't feel well. Nothing in particular wrong, just like maybe I was coming down or something, so I called in sick. No big deal. A couple of weeks later, I felt bad again and took another day off. Then later, a week off. Through all this time, I didn't feel like cooking, so my son and I were eating dinner delivered every day, pizza or Chinese food mostly. Actually, my son was the one doing the eating. I was mostly drinking the Snapple or soda that my son ordered with his dinner. I was not answering the phone, not talking to anybody, not going out, not letting anybody in. After a while, I had a hard time getting out of bed at all.